really believe that in the Christian life, it's so important that we have balance. Now, whether it's what we believe or how we live, it's important that we're balanced. It's important that we're biblical. And in one of the areas I believe it's important that we're balanced is when it comes to the blessings of God. It's so easy to get unbalanced when it comes to the blessings of God. Some people kind of shy away from God's blessings and, and they punish themselves. They believe if I'm a Christian, I'm supposed to practice self-denial, and that is true. We are to deny ourselves. But some people, they perform such a severe form of self-denial that it's actually a form of self-punishment. And they don't really want any of the blessings of God. And yet God does want to bless us. God wants to shower his mercies upon us, and he wants us to receive them with a grateful heart. And then on the other extreme, you have some people who, they just want the blessings of God, and they want all the blessings of God, and they, and they, they get so focused on the material blessings of God that they miss out on the spiritual focus of the Christian life. I want to remind you of two individuals. One is a person from way back in church history, and one is a person who is alive today. This man here, he's on top of a pillar, and he lived around A.D. 400 in Syria. And his name was Simeon, Simeon Stylites. And he was a man that was so dedicated to God, according to his understanding, that he was rejected from a monastery. So he went to become a monk, and he practiced such a severe form of self-denial and such a severe form of self-punishment, the monastery said, we don't want you. You are too self-denying. And so he went out on his own and lived the life of a hermit, and he found this pillar, and he climbed up to the top of it, and he lived there on that pillar night and day for 37 years. Not 37 days, not 37 weeks, not 37 months, 37 years he lived there. And he had, you can see the rope where he would pull up his food and his drink, which he didn't have, a five-course meal. He would basically have bread and water simply to sustain his life. He was a skeleton that was still alive. Now, I guess and I hope that we all would say this is a severe form of self-denial. I don't really think God is calling any of you to go out today and find a pillar and go up there and decide you're going to live on top of that pillar for 37 years. I, I believe the man meant well but I think he was misguided when it comes to the blessings of God. Well, let's look at another extreme. I don't know if you know this man, but his name is Jesse Duplantis. He's a televangelist. He's preached all around the world. And recently he has come out and said that Jesus Christ spoke to him and has told him that he is to buy a brand new jet. And this jet cost $54 million. And this is the jet that Jesus has told this man to buy so that he can fly around and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, th and just imagine who are the ones that are asked to pay for this jet. It's people like you and people like me asked to send in their free uh, will offerings and love offerings. And the sad thing about it is a lot of people will send in money to this evangelist, money they don't have in order to support a vision that he believes Christ gave to him that I actually believe Christ did not give to him. It's his own desires and his own wants and his own wishes. These are two radical extremes. Simeon Stylites. I can't enjoy the blessings of God. I need to deny myself so much that I'm going to find a pillar, I'm going to climb on top of it, I'm going to live there for 37 years and basically eat bread and water each day. And then you have a man that already has, I believe, a couple of jets, and now he wants another one, $54 million jet, to fly around and preach the gospel. The balance is somewhere in the middle. We are not to punish ourselves. We are not to practice such a severe form of, of, of self-denial that we forget that God is a good God. God wants to bless us. I remember, a, 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 basically it was an argument. I want to say a discussion, but it was more of an argument that I had with my mom after I came to town the first time I served here as associate pastor. 
I came here, and she wanted to give me some furniture to come up to my apartment. She wanted to bless me in other ways, and I kept saying, no, I don't want this, I don't want that, because I was kind of, you know, starting out on my own. I wanted to do it all by myself. I didn't want to receive any of her gifts. I didn't want to receive any of her furniture. I didn't want to receive any of her blessings, and I hurt her feelings. And she later said to me, Mark, when you said to me, I don't want that couch and I don't want that chair and I don't want that, not because I didn't like it, because I wanted to do my own thing. She said, you know, that hurt me. And she said, I want you to know as your mom and as your dad, everything we have belongs to you and your brother. When we die, we're going to leave everything we have to you all. Why not let us now enjoy the blessing of seeing you enjoy it? You know, it's hard to argue with your mother because your mother usually wins the argument. And so since then, though we never ask our parents for a dime, we never ask our parents for anything, they have been very gracious to us and they have blessed us in, in many, many different ways and we thank the Lord for that. I want you to take your Bible, if you would, today and turn over to Psalm 1. I'd like to share a message today entitled Biblical Prosperity. And this is an area where we need to be careful that we follow Scripture. We need to be careful that we're balanced because if, if we're not careful, we can easily get off track. There is such a thing as biblical prosperity. That God wants to prosper your life. God wants to bless your life. And I'm not just talking about spiritually, but even materially and financially. There is such a thing as biblical prosperity. We're going to read about it today. But we need to be balanced. We need to be careful. And we need to be biblical. So let's look together. Psalm 1, only six verses. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. That's a key verse in this psalm. In all that he does, he prospers. That's where I get the title today, Biblical Prosperity. The wicked are not so but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Basically, this message today is to teach us how to prosper biblically, how to prosper according to the Word of God, how to prosper as believers in Jesus Christ. And I think if you're here today, you would say, I want to prosper. I want to have success. And not just material success and not just success in the eyes of the world, but I want to prosper in the eyes of God and I want to be blessed by God and I want to live a life that honors God. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And I basically want to give you three instructions of how to enjoy biblical prosperity. And the first is simply don't follow the crowd. If you want to prosper according to God's word and according to God's way, you cannot follow the crowd. I remember studying Sigmund Freud, and he talked about the different instincts in man, and he talked about the three main instincts, the self-instinct and the sex instinct and the herd instinct, and the herd instinct is that drive that we all have that we want to conform, that we want to be like the crowd, that we want to fit in, and you see this all the time with fashion, right? Whatever someone in Paris or New York City decides is fashionable, before you know it, it comes across to the general public and people who are in Paris or people who are in New York City that decided that this was fashionable, now you're wearing those clothes and you didn't even know that they came from that city and you didn't even know that fashion came from this person or that person and yet we just seem to follow the crowd. They decide what's fashionable, and then they pass it down to this person and that person, this community and that community, and this city and that city. And you see someone on TV that you respect or you like. Maybe it's an actor. Maybe it's an actress. Maybe it's a singer, and they're wearing a certain line of clothing. And the next thing you know, everybody's wearing that line of clothing. I remember when I was in school. I can't remember if I was in elementary school or middle school, but I was one of the first kids to wear polo cologne. 
Remember the old green bottle? I guess they still sell it. Let me tell you, no matter how ugly you were, if you sprayed some polo cologne on you as a young man, you had the ladies flocking around you. It was mesmerizing. It was hypnotic. And I thought I was big stuff coming to school with the green polo cologne. And you didn't just do one squirt or two squirts or five squirts. You bathed in it. And you could walk in this sanctuary and the whole room would smell like polo cologne. And then the next thing you know, everybody's wearing polo cologne. Everyone you, you knew had the green polo. We didn't call it green polo back then. It was only polo because you didn't have any other types of polo. And then it was obsession. And then it was Dracar. And you had all the different types of cologne. And one person that was popular, one person that was well-known at school would wear it, then everybody would wear it. We just tend to follow the crowd. We want to fit in. We want to be liked. I remember when my uncle, way back when, I was only about 16, and I worked for him on the farm, and I remember back then, he had a cell phone. And it wasn't a little cell phone you could put in your pocket. It was one you opened up. It was about that tall. It was in a box. And I remember he was, we were in his truck, and we were way out in the field because he, he owned a farm, and he opened up this box, and he got out a phone, and he was talking on this big phone. I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. A man not in a home and no wire connected to it is talking to someone on a telephone. And then the next thing you know... Everybody has a cell phone. Everybody has a smartphone. Even dumb people have smartphones. <laughs> we just tend to follow the crowd. We want to fit in. We want to be like everyone else. But if you're going to enjoy the prosperity that God gives you, you can't follow the crowd. I want to read it to you again, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. By the way, there might be a progression there. You begin by walking in the counsel of the wicked. That is, you're following the advice of the wicked. And then it speaks of standing in the way of sinners. And so now you're associating with them. And then it says you sit in the seat of scoffers. You're actually scoffing the way of righteousness. So you're following their advice, you're associating with them, and then the end result is that you scoff at righteousness altogether. It's a slippery slope when you begin to indulge in a life of sin. And I still remember the first time I ever drank alcohol and the first time I ever smoked marijuana, and I did both the same night. And I thought... I would never go beyond that. And, and that alone was a big step for me, being raised in a church and being raised by a mother who believed in Jesus Christ to actually drink alcohol and smoke marijuana. I thought that was a huge step for me, a very ungodly step. And I said, I will never go beyond that. And even after that, I decided I would never do that again. But I did. I drank many more times after that. I smoked many more joints after that. And then I took some Xanaxes and took some Valiums and did some hits of acid. And even there, I said, I'll never go beyond that. And I remember telling a good friend of mine, I said, I'll, I'll tell you one thing I'll never do. I'll never do a line of cocaine. But he showed up one Thanksgiving, took me out in his Monte Carlo, and he opened up a vial, and he had a gram of cocaine and we did lines of cocaine. Let me tell you, there's an old saying, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. You cannot control sin. You cannot welcome sin into your home and say, I'm going to manage my sinful life. You might as well bring in a lion or a tiger and, and, and put a collar around it and say, this is your new pet. It, it's not, you can't control it. It will control you. It will destroy you. Sin will ravish your life. Listen to what the Bible says about not following the ways of the world. Look at Romans 12, 2. It says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Don't be conformed to the world. 
One translation says, don't let the world squeeze you into its own mold. And it's like fashion. And it's like the different activities that we participate in. We want to be like the world. We want to fit in with the crowd. And the Bible says, don't follow the crowd. Don't conform to this world. Be transformed. Be different. Look at 2 Corinthians 6, 17. It says, therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. I know this is not popular today, but the Bible says we're to live a separated lifestyle which we would call sanctification. We're to live a separated lifestyle. We are not to follow in the ways of the world. We're not to imitate the ways of the world. Our goal is not to fit in. Our goal is to glorify Jesus Christ. And we're to be separate. But you know, you can look up the statistics. You can look up the statistics of the American church and you will not see a difference between Christians and and non-Christians, in how they spend their money, how they use their time, if and how many times they divorce their spouses, you won't see a difference. You basically, the, you see the Christians and the non-Christians, it's like their lives are the same. Shouldn't be that way. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. We are called to be different. Don't follow the crowd. If you want to be blessed, you can't follow the crowd. I don't know about you, but I want to be blessed by God. And what does it mean to be blessed? The word blessed means that you're happy, you're joyful, because you're favored by God and you're cared for by God. That's what it means to be blessed. The joy that you experience because God has favored you and God takes care of you and God watches over you. It's interesting, the first word in the book of Psalms in Hebrew, in Greek, the Septuagint, and also here in my English translation today, is blessed. That's the first word. And, and, and the writer is setting us up and saying, if you want to be blessed by God, you can find out how in the book of Psalms. If you want to be blessed. And we're encouraging all of you to read through the book of Psalms. I'm preaching 10 sermons on the Psalms this summer, I can't preach all 150 this summer, but I thought if I do 10 each summer, it would take me 15 years to get through the book of Psalms. And then Kyle reminded me I can't give one sermon to Psalm 119, so I may have to do a whole summer to Psalm 119, so you at least have me here for another 16 years if I go through the book of Psalms. Some of you are praising and some of you are moaning right now. <laughs> Let's get back to the topic at hand. Blessed. Do you want to be blessed? It's found in the book of Psalms. Blessed means that there's a joy that you experience because God favors you. God takes care of you. God protects you. God watches over you. And 25 times in the book of Psalms, you have the word blessed. We usually think of the Beatitudes, right? Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man that does this or doesn't do this. But in the book of Psalms, 25 times you have the word blessed. You know what the greatest blessing of God is? You say, oh, it's to get married. That's a terrific blessing. Oh, it's to find that home I've been looking for. That's a great blessing. What, what, what is the blessing of God, the supreme blessing of God? Look at Acts 3, 26. I don't know if you've ever seen this in, in this passage, but Acts 3, verse 26, it says, God, having raised up his servant, that is Jesus, resurrected Jesus from the dead, God, having raised up his servants, sent him to you first to bless you. How? By turning every one of you from wickedness. We don't think of God's blessings in that way. We think of blessings as material blessings. Oh, the Lord has blessed me, and I got that home I wanted, and I finally got married, and I, now I have children. And I'm not in any way taking away from those blessings minimizing those blessings. Those are good, true blessings of God. But the supreme blessing of God is when the Lord turns you away from wickedness. And when we pray for people to be blessed, I hope it's not simply that they will enjoy material prosperity, but that they will enjoy spiritual prosperity. I don't even think you can be blessed truly unless you have been turned from a life of wickedness. Is it really a blessing if God just blesses you financially and you're never blessed spiritually? 
Do you know in the book of Romans chapter 1, three times, it says God gave them over? He gave them over to a reprobate mind. He gave them over to their sinful desires. He gave them over to their inordinate affections. You don't want God to wipe his hands of you. And God can do that. And if you keep saying, I don't want your will, God, I don't want your will, God, I don't want your will, God, God may finally acquiesce and say, okay, it's your will. You don't want that. You want God's will to be done. And the greatest blessing is when he turns us away from wickedness. You know, if you go back here to Psalm 1, verse 1, it says, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked... Or as one translation says, you don't follow the advice of the wicked. Counsel, advice means the same thing. You don't follow the advice of the wicked. Do you want to be blessed by God? Be careful whose advice you follow. I don't think we're very careful about this. Let me tell you a missing element of American Christianity. It's called discernment. There's no discernment among American Christianity. We're all gullible. I mean, as, we, as I put on the screen earlier, Jesse Duplantis asking for a $54 million jet, I guarantee you that moment, many people wrote the check for $50, $100, $200, and again, money they don't even have. There's no discernment. We're gullible. We, we, we need to be careful whose advice we follow. Secular counselors. Again, I'm not saying it's wrong to ever go to a counselor who's not a Christian, or a doctor is not a Christian. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is you need to be careful of following the advice of someone who's not a believer in Jesus Christ. Amen. They're not sifting their advice through the word of God. Or talk show host. You know, when Oprah Winfrey used to be a talk show host, there were people in my church, I felt like they were more concerned about what she said than what God said. Or Dr. Phil. Yeah. Or Phil Donahue, for some of you a little bit older. Or not just those on TV, but those on the radio have powerful personalities, and we get influenced by them. But they may not even be believers. Or what about maybe non Christian friends, non Christian co workers, non Christian family members, non Christian neighbors who get in your ear and try to influence you as to what you are to do or not to do, and you need to back away and say, I love you, but I'm listening to God. Amen. When you start listening to uh, talk show hosts and you begin listening to secular counselors and you begin listening to non-Christian friends and non-Christian co-workers, they're not sifting what they say through thus says the Lord. They may give you good advice, but then again, they may not. And they may, say, they may say something that sounds very plausible to the natural ear, but it's not biblical. It's not from God. Think about some of the ungodly advice that we receive. Someone says to you, you know, you can't get along with your spouse, so you need to divorce her to be happy. God wants you to be happy. You're not getting along. You're not... You know, you're just not happy. You need to divorce her. You need to divorce him. Where in the Bible, please, show me one verse. Does it say you have a right to get a divorce because you're not happy? Can you show me one? Not a single verse. You made a vow before heaven to your spouse and all the witnesses that were there. You made a vow. And the vow did not say for better or for better. Is that what it said? If I'm happy, we're going to stay married. If I'm not happy, I'm bailing. Is that what it said? My vows said for better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. Till death do us part. That was my vow. That was your vow, if you use the traditional vows. Now, I realize at times divorce is out of your hands. 
I realize it takes two to remain married. And I also realize there are biblical justifications for divorce, such as infidelity or adultery. I realize that. And I also realize that divorce is not the unpardonable sin. So even if you did commit a divorce and you got divorced and you later asked God to forgive you, God is not going to say, well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to forgive you. That's the unpardonable sin. No, that's not how God operates. And so we need to move forward from here. So if there's divorce in your past and you've remarried, be faithful in that marriage till death do you part. But that's, that's the wisdom, the wisdom of the world. You're not happy, get a divorce. God wants you to be happy. Well, it sounds pretty good, doesn't it? But what did Jesus say? What God has joined together, let no one separate. Not you or not anyone else. Well, what about another advice of the wicked? Hey, it's your money. You can do whatever you want with it. You ever heard that? It's your money. You're the one that worked for it. You're the one that sweat for it. It's your money. Do whatever you want with it. What does the Bible say? Psalm 24. I don't even have to read a verse about tithing. Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Everything in it. The billfold, it belongs to God. My home, it belongs to God. My vehicles, they belong to God. You say, but I work for them. No, you're a steward of the possessions God has given you. You're a steward. And the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God are two different things. The wisdom of the world says, man, if you, if you tithe to the church, you're not going to have enough left to bless and take care of your family. I've never had a single person come up to me and say, God failed me when I began to tithe. Never had anyone of all the years I've been in the church say, I tried to tithe and God failed me, had to back away because I wasn't being blessed. But I've had multiple people tell me, I put God first and I, I can live better off the 90% than I can off the 100%. Amen. You got to trust God. We talk about faith. You, you, you want to talk about faith? If you can't even have faith to give your money to God, how are you going to have faith to be a missionary or a martyr? Starts with your money. Or what about this advice? There's nothing wrong with having sex outside of marriage. Everyone else is doing, doing it. Just use protection. Just use protection. Just as long as it's consensual. That's, that is today's sexual ethic. As long as it's consensual... And as long as they're of age, anything goes. Yet the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 4, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. There's only one place to enjoy sexual intimacy and that's in the boundaries of holy matrimony. And holy matrimony is a man and a man or a woman and a woman. Holy matrimony is one man and one woman for life. One man and one woman for life. And so if you're enjoying or participating in sexual intimacy outside of marriage, it's time to repent of that and or get married. Get married. Do it God's way. You say, I don't know if I want to get married. I don't know if I want to stay with her that long. Well, then get away from her right now. If you have that much doubt that you don't even know if you want to marry her, then why are you with her to begin with or with him? We need to stop following the crowd, especially in the American church. We need to be different. Well, let me give you a second piece of advice and that is spend your time wisely. You want to prosper? Spend your time wisely. Instead of following the advice of the wicked, delight in God's word. Meditate on God's word and do it day and night. You see in verse 2, his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. Let me ask you something and I don't want you to say anything out loud. But I do want you to do a little bit of introspection. Honest introspection. Introspection. What do you really delight in? What, 
what truly brings you joy and satisfaction? Do you delight in sports? Man, you just can't wait to watch the next ball game. You'd rather watch a ball game than anything, especially your favorite team. Now, I love sports, and I'm not anti-sports at all. But if my supreme delight is in sports, it's not right. Is it food? Man, you just can't wait to go out to eat today. You're just chomping at the bit. You want me to hurry up with this sermon so you can get out here and get to lunch. I enjoy food just like you enjoy food, but that cannot be our supreme delight. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Is it watching TV, getting on Facebook, social media? I think for some people it would be harder to fast from social media than it would be from food. I believe it. I believe there are a lot of people you could say, you're going to fast for one day, 24 hours, either no food or no social media. They wouldn't even think, give me my phone. Yeah, I can at least look at food on my phone. <laughs> I can order food for tomorrow on my phone. Give me my phone. I can't, do, I can't go without food. I can't go without my phone. I'll go without food, but not my phone. Not social media, not Facebook, not even for a day. I'm not anti-Facebook. I'm on there too. But is that my delight? Do I wake up and the first thing I want to do is look on Facebook because I got to check my notifications? Who liked my post yesterday? I put a new picture of myself. I put a new picture of my family. Wow. What has happened to us here in America? That's our delight. That's what we live for is who will like our page or post. Again, I'm not anti-Facebook. I'm just saying, what's our delight? What, what brings us pleasure? The psalmist said, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates on Sunday morning. Sunday night. Wednesday night. When I have my devotions. No, day and night, which is a merism that means day and night and all times in between. God created the heavens and the earth is a merism, which means he created everything. So when it says meditate day and night, it's not like, okay, as long as I do it in the morning, and as long as I do it in the evening, that's day and night. No, it means all the time. I'm not saying you've got the Bible out reading it all the time, but the Bible is such a part of your heart and your life that you're delighting in the Word and you're living by the Word and you're viewing life through the lenses of Scripture 24-7. It says you meditate on His Word. You know, to meditate on the Word of God is to ponder its meaning and its application. A lot of people think meditation... When you hear the word meditation, you know what you usually think of? Eastern meditation. So the Hindus and so forth. Eastern meditation is empty your mind of all your thoughts. And you know, you know I had a, there was a situation. I was actually in drug rehab at Charter Ridge Medical Hospital for three months. And they would have you do this. they say, just empty your mind of everything and just meditate and get still. I could never do that. My mind would just keep rolling. It's like right now I can say to you, don't think of a pink elephant. Well, you do. Right there he is. You can see him. Dumbo in pink. Your mind, you can't shut your mind down. Even when you go to sleep, you can't shut your mind down because you dream. And you don't even remember half your dreams. So meditation is not emptying your mind of thoughts. It's filling your mind with thoughts of God. Pondering the word of God. Pondering what it means and how it applies to your life. And you delight in scripture. I'm not going to preach on Psalm 119 this summer, but let me, let me just show you how often the psalmist in Psalm 119 says he delights in God's word. Verse 16, I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Verse 35, lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Verse 47, for I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. Verse 70, their heart is unfeeling like fat, 
but I delight in your law. Verse 77, let your mercy come to me that I might live, for your law is my delight. 143, trouble and anguish have found me out, but your commandments are my delight. And then verse 174, I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. How many of us truly could say that? Do you know how you know if the word of God is your delight? You spend time in the word of God. If you're never reading the Bible, let me tell you, it's not your delight. Because whatever is your delight will consume your time, your attention, your strength. You'll be in the word, and the word will be in you. And when God touches your heart, and you are born again, and you're filled with his Holy Spirit, you will have an insatiable appetite for the word of God. Insatiable. And when we lose that love for God's word, we need to ask the Lord, Lord, refresh me and give me that love for your word. I appreciate how the young girls on Wednesday night, they memorize and share scripture with us, Lexi and Brookie and Sophia. And they'll, Wednesday night, before we have the lesson, they'll quote Bible verses. We need to have our kids memorize the word of God. Graham is memorizing scripture right now. I think he's at five or six verses and I kind of give him the uh, Cliff Notes version of the verses. And he, every time we get done, he says, I want another one, Daddy. I want another verse. I want another verse. I'll say, no, that's, that's enough for now. We'll wait till, you know, just chew on these for a while. Just chew on children, obey your parents for a while, Graham. We'll get to the <laughs> others later. But he loves memorizing the Bible. We need to do that as parents. Some of our kids, they can tell you the full lineup of the Cincinnati Reds, but they can't name five, 12 disciples. That's scary. We know knowledge, it's like trivial pursuit. We know all this knowledge is really not that important, eternally speaking, but what does matter so much, we don't know it. Biblical illiteracy, it's all around us. Look at Joshua 1.8. It says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Again, you want to prosper, you want to be successful, God's way, not your way. How do you do it? You meditate on the word of God day and night. Not just that you meditate on it, but it says, and be careful that you do it. I can memorize all, this, all these scriptures, and I can be an egghead as it as it relates to knowledge and facts, that's not the purpose. You can memorize 100 verses, but if you don't apply any of them, and this person memorizes one single verse and applies it to their life, they are following God, not you. You have to apply the word of God. You want to know how to be saved? You want to know how to make wise choices? You want to know how to prosper in this life and in the life to come? It's all found in the Bible. Look again at verse 3. It says, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. All that he does prospers. That's what I want in my life. All that I do that it would prosper. Well, one, one last instruction I'd like to give you today about biblical prosperity and how to experience it is cultivate a personal relationship with God. Now, it begins with salvation. We, we sang about that we are the sons of God. We are the children of God. Love those two songs. I loved how we had the older one and the new one about being a child of God. There's a sense in which everyone is a child of God by creation, and that is you've been created by God. But there's another real sense in which you're only children of God through adoption. We've all been created by God, but we all do not have a personal relationship with God where we say to him, Abba, Father. And that comes through the new birth and through adoption. You have to be adopted into the family of God. And adoption is such a beautiful metaphor of the grace and love of God. And I remember reading this in a, in, a, in a book once, and the author was talking about that you can have biological children accidentally. 
And, and, and what he meant by that is you may not intend for your wife or your girlfriend to get pregnant, but it could happen. So you could have biological children, at least from your standpoint, accidentally or without intention. But you can't adopt without intention. You can't adopt without forethought. You can't adopt without purpose and inclination. And God has adopted us into his family. He has said, I know your past. I know your present. I know your future. I know your mess-ups. I know your sin. I know your unworthiness. But I want you in my family. God adopts us into his family. That's through the new birth. So we're not all children of God in that sense. We need, we need to be born again, but then we need to cultivate a relationship with God. Develop it, grow in it. Did you know, notice what it says in verse 6? It says, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Now, we usually talk about knowing God, right? It, wasn't there a book called Knowing God? J.I. Packer, Knowing God. We usually talk about knowing God, but even he in that book points out, it's one thing to know God, it's another thing for God to know you. And you will never know God unless he first knows you. Look, for instance, at John 10, 27. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. 1 Corinthians 8, 3. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. 2 Timothy 2, 19. But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. It's, it's one thing to talk about knowing God. It's another thing to talk about God knowing us. You see, the word know in Scripture speaks of intimacy and also of love and choice. You remember Genesis 4.1? Genesis 4.1 said, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. That's the Hebrew word yada. Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived. The word know in the Old Testament was used of the way in which we have children, sexual intimacy. So when you think of the word know, you're, you're thinking of a word that speaks of intimacy and love and choice and decision. And the Bible says that God can know us. You say, well, he knows everyone. Yes, in terms of his omniscience, God knows everyone, but he can know you in that he has entered into a personal relationship with you. And you've entered into a personal relationship with him. You remember what Jesus said that he would say on the day of judgment, I never knew you, right? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. It's more important that God knows me than I know him. And I'm so glad that he purchased me at the cross and sent his Holy Spirit to woo and win my heart unto him and that his grace is keeping me every moment of every hour and I'm a child of God by grace and not because of my own effort or self-will. The grace of God. So let me ask you today, do you know the Lord? Are you known by the Lord? We teach here at town that Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. We're not talking about a religion. Oh, come join the Christian religion. I'm not asking you to join a religion. I'm not even technically asking you to join this church. I'm asking you to have a relationship with Jesus Christ where you know the Lord and that he knows you. And if you do, you'll be blessed. You know, the first two psalms, of course, are Psalms 1 and 2. And they're one of the few psalms in the first book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is divided into five books. And if you notice in your Bible, it begins book 1, and then you have Psalm 1. But Psalm 1 and 2 are one of the few psalms in the first book of Psalms that has no title. And they kind of go together. They're, they're the introductory psalms of the book of Psalms. And, and the first psalm, of course, uses the word blessed, but the last of the second psalm ends on the word blessed. So the first psalm, Psalm 1, 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. And Psalm 2 ends with the word blessed, kind of inclusio, connecting the two psalms. And who's it talking about? Psalm 2 speaks of the Messiah. It speaks of the anointed one. 
It speaks of the coronation of the king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the last verse, verse 12 of Psalm 2, it says, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. You want to be blessed by God? Take refuge in the Son of God. It's not enough to try to obey the law of God. Yes, yes, we need to meditate on his word. Yes, we need to delight in his word. But we will fall short. We will fall short. And even today, you may have been convicted by certain comments that were made, and you thought, oh, I need to study the Word more, and I need to not be on Facebook so much. And that's appropriate that you're convicted. But if we're going to be saved by keeping the law, we're all doomed. I'm so glad Psalm 1 is followed by Psalm 2. And I'm so glad that Psalm 2, which speaks of the Messiah that we know is the Lord Jesus Christ, it ends by saying, blessed are all who take refuge in Him. We need to take refuge in Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. He's our refuge. Jesus and Jesus alone. Well, quickly in closing, did you notice there were two images used of the wicked and the righteous? The righteous are compared to a tree, a tree that's planted by streams of water, and that means that you're healthy and you're strong and you're enduring. You can be a tree God plants. Or... As it says here, you can be like the chaff. It says in verse 4, the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. You know what chaff is, right? It's that useless outer covering of seeds that when you throw the seed up, the chaff blows away. It's useless. And it says here in verse 5, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You know what is sometimes perplexing about biblical prosperity is it is true that God blesses and prospers those who follow him, but it's not always visible in this life. And biblical prosperity is spiritually, but the spiritual blessings are more important than the financial blessings. And the, and the financial blessings are not a right, they're a blessing. A blessing means it's a blessing. It means it's a gift. And so when we start talking about blessings as rights, we've totally misunderstood Scripture. So these televangelists that say to you, send in your seed money, and if you will send me 100, you will get back 1,000, or if you send me 1,000, you will get back 10,000, there's no biblical justification for that approach to spirituality. You may send in 100 and get back 1,000. You may send 1,000 and get back 10,000. You may send 100 and get back 100,000. But we don't serve God for the material blessings. We serve God because we love him. And God blesses us more than we deserve. And I'm thankful he's not only met all my needs, he's met a lot of my wants. But they're not rights that I demand from God they're blessings that come from his grace and his goodness. And so sometimes you see the wicked. Do we not at times see the wicked prospering? The psalmist is perplexed at times by this. Psalm 1 talks about it's the righteous that prosper. But when you go through the book of Psalms, you find like in Psalm 73, the psalmist says, well, why are the wicked prospering, O God? What does God always say? Only for now. There's a day of judgment coming. There's a day of reckoning coming. And you know, if all you have are the blessings of this life, man, you better go out and enjoy them to the full today. You better go out to the finest restaurant you can find in the Miami Valley today. You better go out and buy the biggest house you can find in the Miami Valley today. And you better go out and enjoy all the earthly blessings you can to the full because when you die, the blessings are over. They're over. For eternity. But listen, if you're a follower of Christ, he'll bless you in this life 
and he'll bless you even more in the life to come. He'll meet all of your needs right now, not all of your greeds, but he'll meet all of your needs right now, many of your wants, and then when you die, you'll go into the presence of the Lord to dwell with him forever. Let me end with, with Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. There's a way. A lot of people are following that way. That's why it's called the broad way. You have the broad way and the narrow way because the broad way appeals to human flesh and the broad way seems to make so much sense. Live for yourself. Gratify yourself. Put yourself before other people. Don't sacrifice. Don't give to God. Don't give to the church. Don't follow the way of righteousness. Satisfy your own earthly desires. That's the broad way. That's the way that leads to death. Appears to be right, but it's not. Follow in the way of Christ, and you'll enjoy life now and eternal life in the days to come. Would you stand with me this morning? We're going to give you an opportunity to respond to, to the message. Your response may be coming and just presenting yourself before the Lord and saying, God, I want to be blessed. I want to be blessed any way you want to bless me, Lord. I don't come as a right. I don't come seeking what I deserve. And you might, and there's no shame in this, you may come today and say, Lord, I need financial blessings. We're going through some tough times. I need you to prosper, prosper me in this way. I'm going to seek you first. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And maybe you need some physical prosperity. Maybe you need some financial prosperity. And you come and you say, Lord, I'm asking for this for Jesus' sake, but I'm putting you first, Lord. It's not a right. It's a blessing. Let me tell you the most important thing to seek today. That's Jesus. He is prosperity. And if you have Jesus, you could be the poorest person in Middletown. And you would be filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Because Jesus Christ is enough. Heavenly Father, we pray right now that you would bless each person that's here. And Lord, maybe there are some today that are going through some tough times with their health with their finances, in their marriage. Maybe Satan has whispered into their ear or her ear, his ear. It's time to give up this marriage because I'm not happy. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would rescue marriages. We pray that we would, Lord, put you first in every area of our life and we would enjoy biblical prosperity. And, Lord, if there's any here that aren't saved, they haven't been adopted into the family of God, they've been created by God, but they haven't been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, may they receive Christ today as Lord and Savior. We pray all this in Jesus' name. These two altars are open. If you'd like to come and pray, we have prayer teams that will be glad to meet you down here. We're going to give you an opportunity if you'd like to come and pray as we sing together.